I'm already, you know, in the kitchen 24-7, which is fine. It's a blessing. I might as well take another extra step, you know, to not put the bones in the landfill and put them in my backyard and get free fertilizer. Hey y'all, welcome back to my channel. My name is Bowen. I'm a registered dietitian and homemaker. In today's video, I am going to be showing you how I make my homemade bone broth. I have transitioned from the more traditional method of making it on the stove slowly over the course of 24 hours to using the Instant Pot. I really feel like using an Instant Pot is a game changer for broth. It makes it so easy and you get a very consistent result every time because of the ability to control the heat and the pressure very specifically. When you're cooking it on the stove, it's really hard to get the broth to that perfect simmer point because it can kind of slow, it'll stop you know, simmering and then it'll boil too much and it's really hard to fine tune. So anyway, I'm a firm believer in using the Instant Pot for bone broth. It is a stainless steel pot, so I feel really safe about using it and it's been really great for giving us good gelatinous broth. In a previous video, I showed you all how to make beef bone broth. Beef bone broth is a little bit more complicated than chicken bone broth because you wanna get a variety of bones to get a good nutritious but also tasty broth. Chicken bone broth is a lot more straightforward because you just get a chicken carcass and any other chicken bones you have around, and if you can, add some chicken feet. So this is how I make making chicken broth really easy. Anytime I have a chicken carcass or I make you know, roasted drumsticks or chicken wings, we save all of the bones in a plastic bag and put them in the freezer. When the bag is full, I make a pot of bone broth. About once or twice a year, I go to the farmer's market and get a huge bag of chicken feet. I bring that bag of chicken feet home, I cut off the claws, and I individually freeze the chicken feet at two to three feet per pack so that when it's time to make a pot of bone broth, I just pull out a pack of two to three feet. I feel that it's not necessary to use more than two to three feet per pot of bone broth. I don't wanna say that it's wasteful, but chicken feet are, there's only so many chicken feet, right? <laughs> Out there running around. And they are so concentrated in collagen, you really don't need more than two to three to make a really good gelatinous pot of bone broth. And also, I will add, I have taken the entire bag of chicken feet and made a pot of stock with it. It's not very flavorful because chicken feet don't have any little bits of meat left on them or anything like that. And so it's kind of like the beef bone broth. You're adding in the carcass, which may have a little bit, you know, some tiny remainders of meat, or if you roasted it in the oven, you're adding some flavor into it. It will just taste better if you combine the feet with the carcass and other chicken bones that you have. Let's go ahead and get started with making chicken bone broth in the Instant Pot. So to get started with your bone broth, you're going to need one chicken carcass. This is actually a turkey carcass, but a chicken carcass is the same. It's just a little bit smaller. If you have any other bones that you've saved, like drumstick bones or wing bones, those work great too, and you can add them in as well. What I feel is a really important and great addition to chicken bone broth is chicken feet. Put it in frozen and it works just fine. After you get your bones in, you just want to add filtered water up to your fill line or a little bit under your fill line if you want to play it extra safe. After you get the water put in, you're just going to add a couple tablespoons of apple cider vinegar and you're going to allow the bones to soak with this water apple cider vinegar for 30 minutes before you start cooking. This helps the bones to start to release some of those minerals we want to get in our broth. This is what it looks like before you start pressure cooking it. I cook my bone broth on high pressure for two hours. Make sure that you follow your pressure cooker's instructions for safety so you make sure that it's on ceiling and you have all your settings correctly and it's locked properly before you get started. 
the chicken broth or turkey broth I should say has cooked for the last two hours and now we're gonna do a 20 to 30 minute pressure cook run with some aromatics this step is completely optional it really depends on what you're planning to do with your broth if you want it to have a lot more flavor then you want to do this step so I'm cutting up an onion I leave the skin on I'm doing a carrot if you've got celery you can do that I often do some peeled garlic cloves bay leaves whole peppercorns toss it all in and let it go because it was Thanksgiving, I did have a lot of fresh herbs on hand, so I'm also going to add a lot of fresh herbs to this one, but I don't usually have so many herbs on hand. Once you get your aromatics put in, you're going to close it back up again, seal it, and I do high pressure for 15 to 30 minutes. Anywhere within that time frame has worked well. After the broth has finished cooking, I strain all of the bones and aromatics out. Be careful because it's really hot if it splatters. Some people strain their broth through a cheesecloth. I just don't bother with that step. I really don't find it necessary for what I'm doing. If you want extreme clarity or there's some sort of reason, then you can. But this works really well. Any kind of little chunks of meat or just anything that ends up in the broth will usually rise to the top and get stuck in the fat and you can skim that off. Now I'm just getting the broth poured into glass jars to help it cool quicker. Once it stops steaming and it's cooled a little bit I'll transfer it to the fridge. You want to make sure you're cooling it down in a timely manner because this is still considered a food. It's best to chill it in the fridge overnight and then the next day skim off the fat. Okay, so that's how you make chicken bone broth. It's really easy, it's versatile, you can flavor it how you want and customize it to whatever recipe you're making. In the second part of this video, I'm going to be showing you how I turn those bones that I used for broth into bone meal. It is important that you use bones that you've made broth with for bone meal. The reason being is that that longer prolonged cooking process or just the pressure from doing, an, doing the broth in an instant pot is going to help soften those bones up even more and it's going to get all of the meat off the bone. There's going to be nothing left on the bone. A lot of times when you pull bones out of a pot of bone broth they start to fall apart, they break, they get really mushy. That's good. But there's a few more steps you want to take to get them ready to use in your garden as a fertilizer. I really love this idea of making my own bone meal because I make my own bone broth. Why not just take it a step further? I'm already, you know, in the kitchen 24-7, which is fine. It's a blessing to be cooking all the time and have the skills. Um, I might as well take another extra step, you know, to not put the bones in the landfill and put them in my backyard and get free fertilizer. So I'm going to say that I'm a beginner gardener, I'm no expert gardener. I do know that bone meal is a slow release fertilizer. It's high in phosphorus and it's surely got some calcium in it as well. So do your own kind of research on what plants you want to use it with and how to use it and those types of things. I'm still learning that part of it myself. I just know that it takes a lot of bones to get bone meal. I've got a tiny little jar of bone meal. I've done this maybe four times already and I barely have any bone meal. So it takes, you know, deliberate effort to remember, oh yeah, we can still recycle these bones, let's not throw them away. Another tip that I want to add that I have found with making bone meal is that it stinks. It just doesn't smell good. There's no fat, there's no meat, there's nothing juicy left on the bone at this point. So you are roasting dry bones and it has an interesting smell. So what I plan to do going forward is that after I've made a pot of bone broth, I'm going to then put those bones back in the freezer and label it bone meal. And then when I've got a full bag of bones for bone meal, I'm going to do it all at one time versus doing like a small amount of bones, you know, little by little. 
We also have to think about those types of things when it comes to saving electricity, when it comes to saving gas. We have to work on being more efficient to preserve resources that we have. So with all of that being said, there's really only a couple of steps to making bone meal, and that's basically that you roast the heck out of the bones until they're dry and brittle, and then you mash them up. And if you don't have a high-powered blender, you just mash them, mash them, mash them, use a rolling pin, use a hammer, just get them as fine of a powder as you can. What I do is I'll kind of hammer them out and then I blend them in my blender until they're like a powder and I'll show you that in the next few clips. I store it in a jar in my garage and I'm hoping to just really continue doing this throughout the next year so that next spring I have enough bone meal to really make a substantial impact on my garden. I have no idea if I'll be able to roast, you know, make enough of it to really help. But I'm going to see over the course of a year because I'm going to be really diligent in about saving every bone that I possibly can. And I'm even thinking of ways, you know, what are some cheaper cuts of meat that I can start buying more frequently so that we can get bones at least once or twice a week in our house so that we can be preparing and making fertilizer for our garden for next spring. So all you do is go through what you've cooked and see what bones are salvageable in terms of you know there's not too much skin or meat still attached what can you separate that's strictly bone get all of that laid out on a cookie sheet and then bake it at 450 until the bones appear to be dry it's hard to give an exact time because again your bones could be really small or big I don't know what kind of bones you're using it really depends on the size so I say you know check it every 10-15 minutes and go from there after the bones have been baked and they are dry and brittle you mash them up so I start by just getting them kind of broken apart this way before transferring them to my blender and really processing them into a fine powder. Depending on what kind of tools you have, you may not have a high powered blender. You can probably just continue to beat the heck out of them until they all turn into powder. All right, all. Well, I am so thankful that you are here watching my videos and for your support and growing my channel. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. Don't be afraid to comment if you have any ideas or want to share something. I love seeing everyone's comments. And if you're new and you want to stick around, hit that subscribe button. Thank you so much from my kitchen to yours. I wish you the best of health for years to come.